Good morning, Faith Church. It's good to see you here on this Lord's Day. I, uh, first time preaching, well, actually second now, because I was here the first hour, so this is my second time preaching here at, at uh, Faith East. I hail over from the north side. <laughs> it's definitely an honor and pleasure um, to be with you here uh, this morning to get the opportunity to open up uh, God's Word for you this morning. I hope you're encouraged by what you hear from the Word of God. Um, if you would turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 20, we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 31, but in the meantime, I want to, while you're turning there, I want to read to you a passage from John chapter 14, verse 27, it says this, Jesus said this, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor fearful. What Christ offers his church, what Christ offers you, is alien to this world. It's a commonwealth that is otherworldly. And this commonwealth has been granted to you because you surrendered your lives under the lordship of Christ. Jesus offers you a kind of peace, again, that is alien to this world. It's, compre it's incomprehensible. One of the things that my uh, professors have told um, us when I attended over there at the master's seminary is that the word of God is simple enough that a child can understand, yet it's deep enough to drown the smartest theologian. And so when it comes to the peace that Christ offers you, it is rich, it is deep. It goes down into forever. It is a comprehensive peace. It is a powerful peace. And so this morning, I would hope that you would be able to get a glimpse of your God and that he offers you a comprehensive peace. We're talking three kinds of peace that's made available to you because of the death, burial, and resurrection of your king. That is Christ. It's a, it's a peace that overcomes fear. It's a peace that overcomes fear. It's evening of the resurrection. The disciples have already received the clear testimony of Mary Magdalene that Christ has risen from the dead. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, quote, I have seen the Lord and that he said these things to her. But where are the disciples? They're nowhere to be found. They're nowhere to be found in the public square. They're in hiding. Jesus had promised them <laughs> peace to overcome their fear. But yet we find that they're so fearful. They're fearful. Their fears are misplaced, and sometimes our fears are misplaced, right? Sometimes our fears are misplaced. Verse 19, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, right? That's what Jesus said. Well, verse 19, so when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, but Jesus said in John 14, my peace I give to you, right? So why are they so fearful? What's going on? I've given you peace, not as the world gives peace. The peace that I give you is incomprehensible. The ten are together. Thomas is nowhere to be found. Judas had defected from the faith. The disciples are fearful. Phobos in the Greek, it's where we get our, the Greek, the English word for phobia. In other words, fear had so arrested the disciples' hearts that it caused them to withdraw from the public square. They were fearful. 
Fear had so petrified the Lord's people that they had neglected Jesus' imperative to not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, right? In Matthew chapter 10, fear had so spooked the disciples' heart that what they were supposed to speak in the light became muffled in the darkness. The proclamation of the gospel of Christ was no longer on the housetops to be heard, but it was hidden behind locked doors. They were afraid. They were afraid that the temple police was coming for them next like they came for their Lord. I mean, it's not that they had forgotten what they had heard or what they have seen with their eyes or what they have looked at and touched with their hands concerning the word of life, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. But the settled conviction of Christ returning to them was yet to take soil in their hearts because it was, they were slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken about their Christ who had to suffer and die and, on, and to come into glory, Luke 24, right? We remember that. They were slow to understand. It didn't yet take soil in their heart. They were having trouble. They were fearful. I mean, you have to remember that the reason why our Lord opened up, as it were, the revelatory curtain for his disciples to go ahead and peer into was to show them that he had already written the story, that he has the whole world in his hands, and for this reason that they could have peace. And that they could embrace their calling and overcome the fear that they had. And even though God's people are appointed for tribulation, you can take courage knowing that Christ has what? He's overcome the world. That's why the cross is so beautiful. That should our hearts ever condemn us, should our hearts cloud seeing a glimpse of our God, he is greater than our hearts. First John tells us in chapter 3. Whatever it is that we may feel, my feelings and your feelings are given to the Father's control. His wisdom shall govern my body and soul. His word is sufficient. I seek not a sign. I grasp but the promise in Jesus is mine. The tide of emotions may run as it will. The Son and the Father abide in me still. I dare not confide in a rapturous frame, but stand on the promise forever the same. So committed is Jesus to you and to his people, to the church that has promised to return to his disciples and finish the work that he began with them and in them was manifest for his disciples to see. Jesus came, verse 19, and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you, peace be with you. Irene in the Greek refers to a, a calm, a peace of mind. The Jewish expression is shalom. It means peace be upon you. I mean, why, why in the world would Christ say that? And I think the answer is pretty obvious because he, his, he knew that his disciples' hearts were being swallowed up by fear. So what does he do? He shows them that death has been swallowed up in victory standing right before them. And then the disciples misplaced fears. They're beginning to roll away because of their remembrance of what he said about the empty tomb. Because of their remembrance of what he said about his resurrection. It's the sunrise in their mind and the penetrating light upon their hearts and their fears are running away. Look, my friends. <laughs> the cross reminds us, right, of where we first saw the light and the burdens of our heart. What? rolled away and that the Christ standing before them in their midst was their hope of glory to assuage their fears but I think there's something even more spectacular and it's this that despite the disciples weakness despite their failures Christ would remain committed to his people Christ would remain committed to his people. Jesus came and he said what? He said, peace. Peace. I love what Pastor Virus said. If you know, you've, some of you, if you've been around Pastor Virus for many years, you know that he, that he has a way of saying certain things. I love when he says, 
things like this. One of the things he said was, what the resurrected Savior is offering them is not a lecture about their failures and a heap of guilt and shame or a pink slip while he finds a more reliable group. Peace be with you. John 14, peace I leave you, Jesus said. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And it's that golden oil of peace that is dispersed abroad to you, to God's people, as a melody that is sweeter than a psalm. In celestial strains, it unceasingly falls over my soul like an infinite calm. But it's not this ethereal kind of peace, you see. It's not ethereal. He's pointing to himself as the prince of peace when he comes with overwhelming confidence and evidence. Verse 20, look at what it says. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw their Lord. Now, John is giving us a condensed version of what had happened, but if you were to put all of the accounts together, it would read this way. This is actually, this is coming from a harmony of the Gospels. If you read it, put it all together, it would read this. Jesus, Luke's account, said to them, but they were startled and frightened and thought that they were, what? Seeing a spirit. Verse 38. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Verse 39. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see me, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. John's account. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his feet and his side while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement. You see, the fear is rolling away. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw their Lord. I mean, it makes sense, right? It makes sense that they were startled and frightened. I mean, have you ever seen a resurrected body before? I haven't seen a resurrected body before yet. All I am used to is death and seeing death. I'm not accustomed to see a resurrected body. We're not accustomed to that. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there, supernaturally just showed up in the midst of his disciples, and the apostle wanted his readers to know that the doors were shut when Jesus came and stood in their midst. I mean, I don't blame them. Christ standing before them in his glorified body that was, it functions very different than what it was prior to the cross. So Christ had to demonstrate him. He had to strike evidence for them that it was really him, that he was not some apparition. But later on in chapter 8 of Romans and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle would go on to tell us that there is a glorious revealing coming to the sons and daughters of Eve in reference to the redemption of our body, which will bear the function and characteristics of a body like Jesus' glorified body. We will possess someday a glorious body. We will possess a power-filled body. We will possess a spiritual body. You get supernatural. But because of Christ's victory on the cross, Christ has won for you spoils of war. As it were, Ephesians chapter 4. What a glorious day it'll be, right? (laughs) To see the celestial throne of grace. To see that emerald throne of grace. And resurrected bodies like Jesus' very own will rise to meet our Savior with joy around his throne. We'll marvel at the mercy that bids poor sinners come, be welcomed at his table, and share his heavenly home. Oh, joy of resurrection, all sin and sorrow past, to see the face of Jesus, to be like him at last. Made perfect in his image, complete in Christ the Son, in resurrection glory will share the life he won. Oh, resurrected body set free from pain and death, since cursed forever vanquished by Christ's victorious breath. Oh, resurrected body, young and vibrant, radiant, free, with powers unthought of, undreamed of of how rich your joys will be. 
through endless years to marvel, design, create, explore, in resurrection wonder to worship, serve, adore. With holy joy, Lord Jesus, we sing the life that you give, the hope you hold before us, the strength by which we live. Lead on in sovereign mercy through all earth's troubled ways till resurrection bodies bring resurrection praise. Amen. Cannot wait to see that day, to see the city beyond the horizon. <laughs> and again, as Pastor Virus would often say, if you know that you know that you know, right? If you know that you know that you know that you are in Christ, that promise is yours. It's yours. You will be a portrait of grace. You will be a hymn of his praise. But if you have not, perhaps there is one person here or two or more. I don't know. If you have not surrendered your life under Christ, the banner of Christ, if you have not repented and turned away from your sin, there will come a time Revelation 22, when the Lord will raise you up in a resurrected body, but it will not be glorified. It will be your body for sure, but it's one that is suited for condemnation. It's suited for damnation forever. You will be a refuse of damnation. Revelation 22, but for the saved, <laughs> you will be resurrection wonder. And he will seal you so that you remain righteous forever. Christ is your prince of peace. Embrace him. Look, recapture, can you do this? Recapture the wonder of the calling with which you've been called. Every day, we get into this book, whether it be a couple minutes or so, and sometimes we get bored. Why? Perhaps we need to recapture the wonder of the cross and the glories to come. And he's granted peace to you. Embrace it to overcome your fear. Embrace it. Embrace the peace. Embrace your calling because of the certainty of it. Because of the certainty of your calling. Verse 21, so Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, he's recommissioning them. As the Father has sent me, I also sent, send you. After Jesus' disciples were fully convinced that their Lord was standing right there in their midst and that he wasn't some ghost or apparition, some spirit, their fears were assuaged and Christ stood before them in victory as it were, as the Gettys would sing, bursting forth in glorious day, yes. Because up from the grave he rose again. And because he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, yes. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. Embrace it. Embrace the call into which you've been called. Embrace the peace to embrace it. Embrace what Christ has already given to you. He's given to you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Embrace it. Peace has returned. Embrace it. That's certainly what they did. That's exactly what they did because of the empowerment of your mission and yours. Verse 22. And when he said... And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Stop there for a second. I just want to kick this rabbit and just keep focusing on the main point, okay? I mean, I don't really kick rabbits. I have a lion head rabbit. I don't kick it. I, you know, I try to cuddle it, you know, try not to eat it, you know. My daughter has warned me over and over again, daddy, no. So I'll try not to. I'm a hungry guy, you know. I like to eat food. I like to eat meat, you know? I'm so glad to be a Gentile. Let me go ahead and... We... <laughs> I gotta, I gotta keep focusing. The disciples were, they were born from above, okay? Let's start there. The disciples were born from above. And the reason why we know this is because 
In John chapter 15, Jesus called them clean. Follow me so far? Except one person. Who is it? Judas. Judas. So what's going on here? What's going on here is really no different than what some Old Testament prophets did by acting out a prophecy of what would happen to Israel in the future. Jeremiah acted out a prophecy before Israel in Jeremiah chapter 13. Ezekiel acted out a prophecy in chapter 4 to them. In other words, it's an object lesson. You could say also that it was a pledge of what was to come by virtue of the certainty of their calling. Pentecost is going to come. And so he acted out a prophecy for them. In other words, a change was taking place. Something was happening. You have a transition between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old priesthood and the new priesthood is taking shape. The Holy Spirit would not just be upon a few individuals to empower them for special service, for ministry, but the Holy Spirit would also be in them, giving rise to the greatest thing this, church, this world has ever seen, the rise of the Christian church. And to empower all those who believe in Christ alone. So embrace it. Embrace it, sons and daughters of Eve. You set apart ones, you Set apart sons and daughters of light. Embrace it. That's what you are in Christ. Embrace it. He has, according to John 15, appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. If he has appointed you, he has empowered you. If he's empowered you, we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid. He's empowered you for a reasonable service. You get that? It's a reasonable service. It's a seasonal service. Service, what do I mean by seasonal service? When your reasonable and seasonable service is over, when it's fulfilled in the proper time of God's own choosing, may it be said of you like it was for King David in Acts chapter 13, after he had served God, God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep. His time was over. At some point in time, your ministries will be over, church, faith church. It'll be over. At an appointed time of his choosing, he will call you home as you pray upward to him. One day, he will reach down to you and take you home. He will take you home. As the Father, verse 21, has sent me, I send you. May your feet glow with the preparation of the gospel of peace. May this world see that Christians still roam the earth. May your feet glow with the preparation of the gospel of peace. My goodness, they wear their sin on their sleeve. Wear the cross on your sleeve. But do it with a velvet glove. Do it with love. And in the midst of that velvet glove lies an iron fist, the word of God. The word of God. It's significant because of the empowerment of your mission. Because of the significance of your mission. Verse 23. Verse 23. Jesus said to them, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Okay, stop the bus for one second. What in the world does that mean? Ah! What does that mean? <laughs> Ever come across a passage and you're reading it and it makes sense? And then you come across a passage like this, it's just like, I don't get it. I'm going to try to do my best here, Okay. It means, big picture, 33,000 feet up, it means that the apostles were foundational to the building of the church. They were appointed to carry out the divinely authoritative apostolic message, the gospel. They were appointed to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, we read, Peter said, repent and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, if the hearers accepted the apostolic message of the cross, and if they would repent and turn away from their sins, they will be forgiven by God, and the Holy Spirit will take up residence in those who have repented. But if the apostolic message, get this, if the apostolic message is rejected, 
then their sins are not forgiven and the spirit of promise will not take residence in them. The apostolic message of the cross has been handed down to God's people, the ecclesia, the called out ones called the church. That's why Jesus can say in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, that whatever you, quote, bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Meaning that if a person refuses to repent, if they don't accept the apostolic message of the cross, they are, quote, unquote, bound in their sin, you see? Bound in their sin. If a person repents, they are forgiven or loosed from their sin. And heaven is in agreement with that verdict, with the church, because it is in accordance with his word. See that? It has nothing whatsoever to do with us or me having authority in and of myself to expiate sin. I don't have that kind of power. I can't remove a person's sin. I can't expiate it. And it definitely has absolutely nothing to do with us having the authority to bind Satan. By the way, whoever keeps binding Satan, who in the world keeps letting him loose? <laughs> Just bind him and get it over with, right? The whole point is that this passage has been used and misused over and over again in so many circles. Listen to what Merle C. Tenney said. Listen to what he said. He said, God does not forgive men's sins because we decided to do so, nor withhold forgiveness because we will not forgive because we will not grant it. We announce it. We don't create it. This is the essence of salvation. And all who proclaim the gospel are in effect forgiven or not forgiven sins, depending on whether the hearer accepts or rejects the Lord Jesus as their sin bearer. In other words, my friends, the mission of the church as sent ones to a dying world is to simply proclaim the apostolic message of forgiveness provided in Jesus alone. If they receive the message of the cross, their sins are forgiven, their sins are loosed. You see that? But if they reject the cross, their sins are not forgiven by God. They are still bound, you see that, in their sin. Because the, and the church is in agreement with God and his message, and that's a significant message. That's a significant message. Listen, the message that you bear is the pearl of great price. It is the pearl of great price. It's a message that is true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Ring it out, ring it out, ring it out. It will give them courage anew. So tell the world of saving grace and make it known in every place. You know, it's not just for the lost, right? <laughs> it's for us, too. It's for us who always need to be reminded of the sewer to which God has pulled us out of. Because... In getting me, God wasn't getting anything good. In getting me, God wasn't getting anything that would benefit him or add to him in any way at all. He chose for whatever reason that I don't understand. He set his love upon me and I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. And I saw him for who he was, and he is so beautiful. You think I wanted to stand here before you and preach the message of the cross? I never wanted anything of this. I had no clue that I would be up here at one point in time preaching the message of the cross. And it was as though the hounds of heaven were chasing me, working as a lot associate at Home Depot. I could not stop thinking about Christ. And then the, home, the manager said, David, what's wrong? And I'm almost in tears. I'm like, I don't know. I didn't want to think that I was thinking about Jesus too much. Otherwise, he'd think I'm nuts. I said, I need to go home. And he sent me home. And then at one point, I was invited to a play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, and I heard the gospel articulated for the very first time. And I've never ever felt such conviction in my life. And then when he got a hold of me, slowly things began to change. I couldn't make sense of it. My worldview began to change. My lifestyle began to change. Things that I wanted to do, I became under conviction. I'm like, I don't know, I don't, don't want to do that anymore. Why? Because I saw a glimpse of him. You saw a glimpse of him. Why are you here? Because you saw a glimpse of him. Amen. That's why you're here. <laughs> That's why we're all here. We are, we are trophies of his grace. 
We are portraits of his grace. Because of his great love, right, with which he loved us, Ephesians 2, 4 and 10. Even when we were dead in transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. And kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then it says in verse 8, for by grace you've been saved. Through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not lest we should boast. You see that? In other words, it's not what you do or don't do that makes you right with God. It's what Jesus did for you on the cross so that you can one day see the city beyond the horizon. To see that emerald throne of grace. So don't underestimate significance of your mission. Never grow gray in the eye or dull in the hearing. And as Pastor Virus would say, there's pace that helps you overcome fear and peace that helps you embrace your mission. There's peace to overcome your doubts. We've already been given it. And Jesus meets us at our point of need. Every need. Listen to this. But Thomas, verse 24 and 25. Thomas, one of 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my fingers into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe, end quote. Wow, doubting Thomas. Wow, man, wow. I mean, you want to talk about an Eeyore approach to life while singing Doris Day song, que sera, sera, whatever will be. (laughs) Will be, or you want the accent of the Godfather, whatever will be, will be case say rah, say rah. <laughs> I mean, do you remember? Do you remember what Thomas said about the trip where Christ was going to raise Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11? Therefore, Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go so that we may die with him. Okay, say rah, say rah. Whatever will be, will be. <laughs> no, no, Thomas. But do you remember? Unless you forgot that we're not really much different than Thomas. I mean, it's as though a stormy cloud was just over his head. He made this incredible expression of doubt. And you have to. You have to wonder if he thought that everybody was making this up, right? I mean, what, what are they, are they making this up? All of them? They, all, so many witnesses to see the resurrected Christ. I'm going somewhere with this. Thomas had spent three years with, with Christ. Christ had opened up the curtain of his revelation, as it were, so that his disciples and Thomas could peer into to encourage them that Christ had the whole world in his hands, Right? And here we find Thomas now, is, he's basically reverted to some sort of strange fatalistic negativity. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. But despite his being a jar of clay, like us, Christ still remains committed to his people. Christ remained committed to Thomas at his point of need even to doubting Thomases like us at times, right? I mean, let me just give you an illustration of this. Just to, just to, to take the knife and just put it even further in. Just stab you, spiritually stab you people. <laughs> to the north end. <laughs> I'm totally joking. <laughs> take a look at me. Go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. I think I got the text right. John 16. Sometimes I forget my place here. All right. John 16, 29 and 30. Jesus is hours away from being arrested and crucified. He told them what was going to happen to them, and they are discouraged. 
So he's comforting his disciples. Jesus read their thoughts and knew that they wished to question him. He read their thoughts. And after he read their thoughts, the disciples turned around and said this, Lo, now you're speaking plainly and are not using figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things omniscience, right? We know that we, we, we believe that too, right? Just like the disciples. We know that Jesus knows all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. In other words, because Jesus read their thoughts without asking them what they were, now they believe, huh? And so then Jesus turns around and he says this. He says, do you not, now, now, really, now you believe? Behold, an hour is coming. And it's already come for you to be scattered Scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the father is with me. In other words, to put it simply. Ah, okay. So, so now you've entrusted yourself to me because, because I can read your thoughts. Now you believe I'm omniscient. I mean, how about this? Even though you believe in me, you know who I am. You're going to be scattered. Do you still believe in me? Do you still trust in me? Do you still believe I have the whole world in my hands? How in the world is telling his people beforehand that they are going to fail him? How in the world is that encouraging? Ever think about that? Only in this way. Think about it. Here's the implication. Here's the application. That in the disciples' weakness, in the disciples' failure, Jesus would still remain committed to his people. In our weakness, church, in our failure to follow him like we should, with the full knowledge of who he is, Christ remains committed to you. And that is why the cross is so beautiful. You see that? Our sympathetic high priest reminds us all that we can be people of what? Little faith. Little faith. Matthew chapter 6. We know Jesus knows all things. We know that. We know that he's given us his special revelation. We know how it's going to end. Yet we still manage to have little faith. Yet Jesus is still faithful and committed to his people. I mean, think about it for a second. What did Jesus promise? In Matthew chapter 28, he said what to the church? I am with you. (laughs) I'm with you always. He's here right now. I'm with you always. And so we, we know. We know this. We know this. Well, we know what happened with Thomas, right? We know what happened with Thomas. Verse 26 and 27. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your fingers. I have to wonder if Thomas got emotional just seeing him. Reach here with your finger. And see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Be believing. Thomas heard the testimonies of Mary Magdalene. He heard the testimonies of the other disciples. He even heard the testimony of the scriptures and all that the prophets have spoken. That Christ had to suffer the humiliation of the cross and then enter into his glory. Thomas heard, but he, he, he just needed to see Christ for himself. And so our Lord is sympathetic to Thomas' weakness. And it's at that moment where Thomas' weak faith becomes strong, becomes sight. And it results in an extraordinarily powerful affirmation. Verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. You want to talk about forgiving grace? What a demonstration of God's forgiving grace. Listen to what Pastor MacArthur said. 
about this passage. He said this. He says, that was enough for the doubter. His melancholy skepticism dissolved forever in light of the irrefutable evidence in the person confronting him. Overwhelmed, he made perhaps the greatest confession of any of the apostles, revival only by Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah. Significantly, Jesus, significantly, Jesus did not correct him, but accepted Thomas's affirmation of deity. And what did it do? What did it do? It points to a delightful possibility. Verse 29. Jesus said this, so because you've seen me, you, you believe, Thomas? Blessed are they who did not see, yet have, yet believed. And so, my friends, this was softly penned, not just for Thomas's sake, not only for the disciples' sake, but for you who have yet to see your king. But like Thomas, get this, like Thomas, who saw his Lord, one day our faith will become sight. And when we see our Christ, we will say with joy, my Lord and my God. In the most powerful affirmation, verse 30 and 31, therefore many are the signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And what else comes with life in his name? Peace. <laughs> peace. 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 Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Father in heaven, <laughs> Lord, in every way we are so much like the disciples, Lord, in our weakness. You still remain committed to your people, but at the same time, although you remain committed, Lord, you've also remained committed to give us peace. So help us to rest in you and to have peace while we walk the walk to which you've called us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.